So today, we're going to focus initially on the growth of the city of Richmond and highlight the continuing importance of the transportation and distribution sectors to our local economy. And we'll look for some answers to that question of what steps are we taking to keep our community moving and ensure our economic vitality. We'll then move along to community safety, a bit about finances and sustainability. And finally, we'll look at some of our impressive achievements, our plans, and our milestones. Now, Richmond is well known as a city on the move. Our current population has surpassed 225,000 people. And under the official community plan, uh, 2041 calls for uh, a population of 280,000 people, and we think that that is well within our reach. The economic growth in the city of Richmond remains strong. Last year, we had the second highest year for building activity on record with $879 million in building activity. And we believe that that trend is going to continue, that there's many more large development projects which are in process and many of them we're going to talk about today. You only have to go outside here to realize that most of the growth is right here in the city center and that's all transit oriented development and it is according to our plans. Now a good example of a major growth area is the Capstan Village. This, if you see this map of uh, the city and the streets. This is the city center outlined in red. And the green area is the Capstan Village area, 57 hectares in size. And it's envisioned as a mixed use uh, waterfront arts community. When that is fully built out, there will be 15,000 residents in the area and 3,000 jobs. And the orange dot that you see in the middle that is the Capstan Canada Line Station. We'll mention that in just a few minutes. Within that area, this is one of the projects. It has started uh, construction. They've started construction on it. It's the ViewStar project. By the time they are finished, there's going to be some new roads and streets uh, through the area. Nine towers, 850 residential units. And also, it's going to be the location for the new City Center North Community Center. Now, elsewhere in Richmond, there's many new developments. Most of them that I'm going to mention are in the planning phases at this point. All of them have residential units, office, affordable housing. They're all going to be tied into district energy. And some of them have market rental, and most of them have commercial space as well. So the first one to mention is the area in orange. That is the Lansdowne Center. It's a 50-acre site, and the property owners are finalizing their plans for a major redevelopment. It's going to be built in phases, 4 million square feet of new residential space, and the retail space uh, will be about 750,000 uh, square feet in size, the retail and the office space. Now, if you look at the artist's concept for this development, so at the bottom along the green, that's Lansdowne at the top is Alder Bridge. You'll see this street right here, that's Hazel Bridge, and it goes north-south through the, uh, right through the site. Eventually, it'll be hooked up to streets farther down. And this, over here, that's Cooney Road. And that's going to travel right through the project as well. And in the bottom left-hand corner right there, that's 50,000 square feet where they're going to have a city uh, community amenity, and we haven't determined exactly what that's going to be done. So with a 50, 15 to 20 year implementation plan, the detailed master land use plan is being worked on right now. Then if you go right across the street, across number three road, this is Townline's Lux project with four residential and office towers. And again, right in front of the property, 
is on Lansdowne, so there will be a continuation of that uh, linear greenway. Farther to the south, at number three road in Alderbridge, that's the atmosphere project. We're just starting on that uh, quite soon. We've got 800 residential units with seven residential and office towers. We've got some north, south, and east-west streets running through the property. And, and again, that's an effort to improve the uh, roadways in the city center area. Now let's move farther south. The area in purple that you see on that slide, that's the south end of the Richmond Center. And that, for that, they are going to demolish uh, the, Sear, uh, the Sears building. They'll demolish the parkade and part of the south end of the mall. And ultimately, there's going to be 12 towers built in two phases with 2,200 units in total, 150 affordable units, 200 market rental units, 420,000 square feet of retail space, and interestingly enough, Park Road, which is the road where you find the IHOP, it's going to go across number three road, right through this development, and eventually end up, you'll be able to go right through to Mineroo Boulevard. Then let's look at some projects on the east side of number three road, right across from Michigan Center. This is the Paramount project where the old Staples store was. Uh, four towers, uh, and that project includes an early childhood development hub. We have the Times Square site on number three road between Park and Cook, and that's going to include two towers, as will that one, <laughs> that one there. That one is iForgin's Glitz, which is a two tower development right at the corner of Anderson Road and number three. And moving over just slightly to Park Road and Buswell, we have two residential towers and a third tower which combines office and residential. Like the other projects, this one will eventually tie into the dinner district energy utility. Interestingly enough, this project, uh, they plan to introduce a car share vehicle system into that project so that people have you know, that much less reason to have their own cars. They can rely on public transportation and they can also rely on the car shares. Then moving over to the area by the Oval, uh, the area that you see in green, the whole area, okay, that's the River Green project. The Oval is in blue in the middle and the area in brown is the phase I'm talking about. That's the latest phase that's going to call for three towers. They have started construction. You see what it looks like uh, in construction there at the bottom. And there's the artist concepts for what it's going to look like. But there's going to be a number of amenities. They're starting the new pedestrian pier this year. We've got riverfront amenities, dike upgrades, and a city-owned childcare. Ultimately, in that entire green area of the River Green project, there's going to be 2,100 units. Then let's move over to the airport. Uh, the top picture is the MacArthur Glen Outlet Center, an artist concept of it. They've started on phase two for that project, and they'll have 35 new outlet stores in 84,000 square feet. And at the bottom, I just showed you just a bit of the construction that they're doing. They've got a $9 billion construction program to expand the terminal and their airside resources, as well as making transportation improvements. And moving back uh, on this side of the river, on Sea Island Way, this is right across from the Wall Center Hotel. Uh, this is on Sea Island Way and number three road. This is the new Continental Project. Three towers on Sea Island Way. And interestingly, it's going to have 400 hotel rooms along with university level educational space. Now I could show you many, many other projects which are in construction, but I'm just going to show you one more. And it's across the street from that last project I, saw, I showed to you. It's the International Trade Center, which is on Bridgeport Road. It's going to have a number, it's, it's changing some of the design of the streets around there. There's three towers and uh, a 100 room Opus Hotel. So if you put it all together, all those projects that I mentioned, 
that's the city center with all of the locations shown uh, on that map. So you can see how so much of the development and the density is coming to the city center area. Now beyond development, the overall strength of Richmond's economy is somewhat demonstrated by the fact that we have 15,000 licensed businesses and 130,000 local jobs. We still have one of the highest jobs to worker ratios in the entire region. And the rapid pace of growth is directly affected, of course, by the Canada Line and by our city center area plan, both of which contemplate sustainable transit-oriented development with added density in our downtown core. And we made some key investments along the way. You're all familiar with the Richmond Olympic Oval. We have the city center community center on the top right-hand slide, and our minimum center for active living, uh, which I'll discuss more fully in just a few moments. Now, growth is not just about the buildings. Uh, the civic growth results in heightened economic activity and it enhances our enviable quality of life and it enables us to provide so much more for our citizens. Things like new roads, new parks like you see depicted here at the Aberdeen Park, child care centers, public art and other amenities. And it also funds hundreds of affordable housing units. But expansion of our city also brings its share of challenges. And so we update our policies regularly to make sure that our residential growth reflects our community values. So for instance, with the single family homes, they were getting awfully large, so we made revisions to our massing regulations for the new single family homes. And we all know about the discussions on the size of farmhouses. This is the poster child for the issue at the corner of number four road and Steveson Highway. And so council and then the province has brought in some regulations to limit the size of the houses that are on the agricultural land. We've also uh, revised the development cost charges, uh, taken a look at our affordable housing strategy to keep that up to date, and we extinguished the old obsolete land use contracts that were bringing us houses that looked like this in the single family areas. We've also encouraged more rental housing with a broader array, array of housing forms. So let's turn to transportation. Our strong job performance is closely linked to transportation and distribution. We calculate that transportation of people and goods is involved in almost 70% of Richmond's employment base. So we are a major West Coast hub here in Richmond. This picture, of course, is of the airport. It's the second largest airport in Canada. YVR set a record uh, for its operations with uh, serving almost 26 million passengers last year and moving over 338,000 tons of cargo. Richmond is also the site of a 700-acre transloading facility which offers direct access to Canada's busiest deep sea port, the port of Vancouver and the port property which is in southeast Richmond. We have in the city over 500 freight, logistics and cargo companies, many with household names like you see on the slide. And these are the companies that enable goods to be efficiently distributed within the region and between Canada's major trading partners. So to keep us and our local economy moving, a big focus is on the mobility of people and goods within our city. And that starts with transportation within the rapidly growing city center, which I, I spoke about a few minutes ago. So we've had a number of road improvements. This is the extension, east-west extension of Lansdowne Road. So we have that continuous link now from the Garden City Lands right to the oval. The, the colored area on the side here, okay, that's where that greenway is going to be. As the area redevelops, you're going to have an extension of that greenway. We extended uh, Ackroyd Road from number three road to Menlo Boulevard, 
and construction has recently started on this area. Now let me acquaint you with where we are. Here's the Ginsburg Bridge. Goes on to Gilbert. Here's River Road and Gilbert. And right now there's a lot of congestion right in that area because if you're coming along this way, you make a sharp left turn to go down to the river. So this line in yellow, that's the old CP Rail corridor, and we are in the process of constructing a roadway. It's eventually going to be a four-lane arterial road uh, going from Gilbert Road right uh, to the northeast to, to Canby. And that's, as I say, it's going to be four lanes, but we think that as soon as we finish it, it's going to eliminate a lot of the traffic congestion, which is in the area of Gilbert and River Road. Now, for context, it, in our plans is a 40-acre par park, and that is immediately between that yellow line that I showed you and the river. It's the area in green. We're, we're almost finished assembling the properties in that area for the city, and we expect to start on that park probably in about four or five years. Now, the road improvements, I can tell you quickly, are not just in the city center. We have number two road. We're widening it from Stevenson Highway right through to uh, the dike on the south. And out in southeast Richmond, we made a number of improvements uh, to make sure that the truck movements are as improved as we can make them to get trucks in and out of the port properties as best we can. And I think that that has made a big difference. We're almost finished that project. But of course, if we're talking about traffic and road improvements, one of the elephants in the room is going to be this one. That's the Highway 99 corridor at the Massey Tunnel. And we would all agree, I'm sure everybody in this room agrees, that this is a major problem and we do need a solution to it. I'm also mindful that my hosts, the Chamber of Commerce, have a different opinion than our City Council on this matter. Um, our City Council felt that the massive design that you saw, and these pictures down here show a bit of it, the massive design that was in the previously proposed bridge project was going to impose significant negative impacts on Richmond as well as on the region. And the pictures on the bottom are, are pictures of the model that the province produced, and that's the Stevenson Highway Interchange. And as someone familiar with Los Angeles freeways, I can tell you that that's large for a Los Angeles-sized freeway. That is simply not the answer, according to our city council. That is not the answer to our issues. We've got to look farther than that. We believe that the ultimate solution for the Highway 99 corridor is to look at the entire corridor. Don't just take the congestion here and move it up the highway or down the highway. Take a look at the entire corridor from the north end of the Oak Street Bridge to the south end of the tunnel and uh, we are our city council is very pleased that the ministry of transportation and infrastructure is reviewing that project and we're also pleased that they have made commitments that they're they're taking a look at this is some of the congestion right in on Stevenson highway at the interchange they made uh sort of given us some assurances that there's going to be improvements in that area plus other area uh other traffic areas uh, on Highway 99. So now looking past these projects, we know that the transportation challenges aren't all going to be solved simply by adding more capacity and more asphalt in the process. And our official community plan outlines transition policies towards a more sustainable solution. Part of it is to look at the cars and the car congestions and the alternate forms of transportation. We looked at this in 
2008, and we discovered that 82% of all the car trips, or all the trips that were taken in Richmond were by car. So if you have reliance on cars, and you have a growing population, it seems to me that it is simple to say that that is a recipe for gridlock, and you're going to have a deterioration of your air quality and your quality of life. So our goal has been to reduce the percentage of car trips to below 50% by 2041, get people out of their cars, get them onto their bikes, have them walking, have them on public transportation, have other forms of, uh, of travel rather than just using the, the motor vehicle. And so we made some significant progress in the decades since that time, but much remains to be done. So what else have we done towards this goal of solving our transportation challenges? Well, we all know the importance of the Canada Line. Uh, that has been long established. And the picture that you see on the right, this is the artist rendering for the Canada, Canada Line Capstone Station. We have the necessary funds collected for that station. It's in the process of being designed. Once it's designed, Transing says that they will then construct it within 30 months, and we're looking forward to that. More immediately, by the end of next year, we expect to have 24 more Canada Line cars, so service capacity and frequency is going to increase dramatically. We all need, also need more buses, and more buses on more city routes, and more immediately. So, we expect in the next phase of the mayor's plan that there's going to be a new B-line service between our Brickhouse Station and the Metro Town Station. And also, they're in the process of designing and soon building a bus mall right beside uh, the terminus to the Canada Line where the Scotiabank used to be. Bikes have to form part of the solution. So we're building our network of bike lanes and our multi-use paths, and that's ever expanding. We have now the dockless bike sharing pilot program that is underway, and that it nicely augments the car share programs that have been available in Richmond for some time. And finally, we're a finalist in the prestigious National Smart Cities Challenge, which has been mentioned, it carries a $10 million prize. And the challenge is to envision innovative ways to engage technologies and data that will improve the lives of residents and enhance service delivery. So if you look at this slide, I know it's probably impossible to see all the detail there, but all those dots, those are the proposed sensors and the infrastructure that is going to be built uh, pursuant to that challenge. So our high-tech proposal would provide many, many benefits improved coordination of emergency response, safer streets, greater community resiliency for 72 hours post-disaster, early incident detection of flooding, earthquakes, and spill, not to mention improved communication with our residents. So on your tables, we have the smart city buttons, and you also have on your table, the postcard from the city that talks about the Smart City Challenge. I hope you take, take a look at those, where are the buttons. Our final submission is due for this challenge in early March. And the decision is expected later this spring. A component of the judging criteria is based on the community support shown for our proposal. We need everyone to let Ottawa know that Richmond is your favorite smart city. So visit smartcity.richmond.ca. It's on the postcard, smartcity.richmond.ca, and learn more about how you can help us bring home that $10 million prize. And that would be great for our community. Now let's turn to a bit of finances and community safety. Richmond has traditionally enjoyed some of the lower property taxes and the property tax increases relative to the rest of the region. This year, the tax increase is higher than it usually is. 
And there's a couple of main reasons. First of all, we have from the province the employer's health tax, which has imposed another 1 or 2 percent tax on us. But more importantly, we have made, as a council, a commitment to community safety in response to our growth. Now, if you look to the RCMP, we now have one police officer for every 976 residents, and that's one of the lowest ratios of that kind in the region. So we made a commitment that over the three years we're going to add 51 officers and 20 support personnel over that three-year period. And they will be dedicated for every phase of local policing, from officers on the street to those dedicated to uh, the investigation of organized crime. And similarly for our Richmond Fire Rescue, with the, with the expected community growth, we feel that we need more firefighters, so we've committed to adding 36 firefighters over three years. Total is 107 officers and support personnel, and unfortunately, that goes on the tax draw, and that makes for higher taxes than usual. But we do feel as a council that it is extremely important that we make that kind of a commitment to our personal safety. Now let's turn, take a look at sustainability, because it's a real priority in our official community plan, this concept of building a sustainable community, and that guides much of our efforts. Now this slide is, is quite simple. It shows that after we signed the BC Climate Action Charter in 2008, we took a look at our statistics until 2015. We found in that period of time that we had a 12% growth in population, and notwithstanding that growth, we reduced our overall greenhouse gas emissions in the city by 12%, and in 2015 alone, we estimate that the savings community-wide was $20 million because of the energy efficiency. We've been carbon neutral as a city for a number of years. We expect to maintain that status. And one of the big reasons is the district energy utility, which is on track to become one of the biggest of its kind in North America. And where we are definitely a first in North America is that we have made it mandatory for all developments, all parking stalls in all developments are going to have to support level two electric vehicle charging. We're amongst the leaders in the region for recycling and reducing our garbage. We're close to our goal of 80% uh, diversion in the single family residence, and that's our goal by 2020. And of course, as an island city, Flooding, uh, flooding is very much on our minds as one of our risks. Now with 49 kilometers of dikes and 39 drainage pump stations, here's a couple of them, we think that the risk of actual flooding is very low, but it's because of the attention that we pay to it. Every year we spend over $10 million as a city on our dikes and our drainage systems. That may be okay now, but it's not okay for the future. So over the next 50 years, we believe that we've got to raise all of our dikes over one meter to make them over one meter higher to protect it because of the rising sea levels and because of the extreme weather events that we're getting with climate change. So now let's look at this year. This is the Mineral Center for Active Living. It's a $79 million facility. And the good news is that when it's open, the Aquatic Center is going to increase the water surface area uh, from the Mineral Aquatic Center by 60%. And there's a whole range of different water features in there, some of which are depicted here. We also have an expanded Senior Center for an important and growing segment of our population. It has a two-story design, it has a lounge with a full-service cafe and multi-purpose rooms for all kinds of different activities, everything from an art studio to a woodworking shop to a billiards and games room. And there's much, much more, a very large fitness area, team rooms for sport field users, and three outdoor plazas. Now the bad news is that 
some, some structural problems were recently discovered during the construction, so we can't open the aquatics and the fitness areas just yet. So more information is yet to come. We will be opening in about halfway through March. We'll be opening the other areas of the building. We'll get the pool and the fitness areas open as quickly as we can, but we just can't give you a specific timeline for that. And we've got plenty of other projects that you can look forward to this year. The RCMP is going to be occupying the city center community policing the office at Grant William Gilbert. That will be this year. ASPAC is starting their pedestrian pier at the foot of Hollybridge. We're looking forward to having that. And we have a number of affordable housing projects that are set to open this year. This is the stories project that we opened a couple years ago. Right around the corner from this hotel is a temporary modular housing project with 40 rental units, self-contained rental units for Richmond's homeless population. That's going to open in a couple of months, as well this, uh, this is the 36 bed emergency shelter which is located in the Ironwood area. Now the, the top is a very rudimentary artist concept for what is, what is going to be there. And you can see from the status of construction on the bottom that we've got some distance to go. But it's a 36 bed emergency shelter, it'll open this year. And we're in the Garden City lands. Lots of progress, and we're going to be working on that again this year. Kwantlen Polytechnic is, uh, University is going to carry on with its new farm school on the site. We have a new trail system there, and we're continuing with the extensive landscaping that we have put on the property with new trees and vegetation. And if you look to the top, that's the bog ecosystem, and that's being protected as an environmental preserve. And there's lots more uh, over the next two years. You can look forward to new, a new six-acre West Cami neighborhood park, similar to this one. We're going to be starting on the Stevenson Community Center. We're rebuilding that. We'll have an expanded animal shelter and a new lawn bowling clubhouse for the seniors. So with all that activity, there's lots of accolades coming our way. We've been named as a global active city because of our active, healthy lifestyles. Our district energy has won well more than a dozen awards. We've won awards for our drainage pump stations, for our fleet, for the electric vehicle readiness policy, for stories affordable housing, for the e-services portal, for our city center community center, for the pollinator pasture, and as always, we win awards for our financial reporting. So 2019 is a special year. It's the 140th anniversary of the incorporation of Richmond, and there's going to be a special grant program for the neighborhoods where we assist those neighborhoods in planning some of their celebrations and creating their legacies. But next year is going to be very exciting because 2020 is the year when we host the seniors games. They're now called the 55 plus games, and that will attract seniors from throughout the province. And we're also the host of the CARA Hockey World Cup. That's Canadian Adult Recreational Hockey Association World Cup, which is called the Olympics of Recreational Hockey. Well over 120 teams are going to be coming to Richmond to compete uh, for the prize uh, next year. So let me conclude my remarks by observing that this entire city council term for Richmond will again be very busy, busy as we implement the many initiatives outlined today and continue to deliver the core municipal services which are so important for our community. And so I look forward to working with members of City Council who are depicted here, our staff, the volunteers, the community stakeholders, and all our partners. Together, we will fulfill our vision for Richmond and continue to ensure that our civic services, our quality of life, our economic vitality set the standard of excellence for our region and for the country. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.